Hello everyone, my name is Malik Geltrain, Certified Personal Trainer, Clinical Hypnotherapist, and also Ricky Master. And uh, this is my show, Health Awareness Talk, through www.sirbroadcast.com. Uh, you know, uh, one of the things, uh, my pursuit in life is to achieve health, is happiness, also as wealth. And, uh, you know, a lot of times I tell people about the unification of the spirit, mind, and body. And I think that by unifying all three of these things together, you're able to achieve anything in life uh, that you put your mind, in essence, learning our minds through. Now, it's funny thing when we talk about spirit, mind, and body, we find about three organs. We're talking about our heart. We're talking about what's between our ears, okay, our mind, our brain. And then we're also talking about our gut. And we all write our goals and things down in order to achieve them, but we don't follow through. We don't achieve. Uh, we don't achieve success. We we don't manifest. And I always ask myself. I say, why is that? Now the Bible says that a house divided against itself will fall. So within ourselves, we have to learn how to how to get everything our brains together, which is our heart, our our mind and also our guts in order to give us the necessary follow through that we need in order to achieve our goals, our visions, whatever we wish to achieve in life. And I've brought someone special on the show, um, Miss uh, Suzanne Henwood, PhD, and she's with Embraining for Success. And she's gonna go even to better detail than what I can in order to help us to achieve that. Susan? Hello, thank you, Malik. Lovely to um, connect with you and Kiora all the way from New Zealand today. Um, yeah, I'd love to share with you some of the um, information behind Embraining and where it came from. Um, I'm one of um, five master trainers in Embraining in the world and one of about 50 trainers. So it's a new field, but it's already spreading, which is really exciting. It came from two guys in Australia, Grant Suzalu and Marvin Oka, and they basically started to look at the literature that was pretty convincingly saying that we had two other brains in our bodies that we weren't necessarily using as brains. Um, what they did was look up all the research to back that up. They read the original books. Um, for example, Michael Gershon's book in the 90s really established the gut as a second brain. That's what his book was called. Mm -hmm. And it just, it brought back into the public awareness, really, knowledge that was already there but had kind of got forgotten. And Andrew Armour's done a lot of work with the cardiac brain and, of course, your own HeartMath Institute in the United States has done a lot of work around that. But what seemed to be missing was that these all occurred in one body and nobody was bringing it all together and saying, so if there's a heart brain and a gut brain as well as the head brain, how do we talk to those? How do we interact with them? What would you want to do with them if you could interact with them? And they took two years of having got all the information together they took two years out of their jobs gave up their jobs completely and did a massive action research study on a model to test it out to see if it worked in practice and then they launched it in New Zealand in July 2012 and from there it's just gone from strength to strength and we're training coaches to use this material in a very practical way in a whole number of different contexts. So my passion is healthcare and leadership, mm -hmm. but it's being used in sport, it's being used in health and wellness, it's being used very much with um, management and education, anywhere where there's a coaching component to the role. Mm. Okay, that sounds good. Um, Suzanne, uh, you were a NLP um, um, petitioner, master petitioner, um, I mean, very skilled in this. Uh, before uh, going in the embraining, correct? That's right. I'm an NLP trainer as well. Okay, NLP trainer. What made you want to go over to the next level of embraining that made you say, oh, this is something um, that I really want to do? NLP is a fantastic set of skills, don't get me wrong, and I still use NLP a lot and value it for what it brings. But there were some people whom you couldn't necessarily get the results you wanted with NLP. And also 
the convincing research literature to say that there were other brains that we weren't using within NLP or not so convincingly using just made me want to go and explore and find out more about the possibility of these other brains. So if I'm completely honest, I went to my first training um, to find out what the new skills were and to find out the models. I wasn't really expecting to get any um, particular development for myself. I thought I had done quite a lot of development on myself to that date. Mm -hmm. And I was blown away with the strength and the power of it to allow me to get to know myself even better. So having had such a strong personal experience, I knew it was something I wanted to be able to offer to other people. Oh, that's super. That is definitely, that's super. I mean, a lot of people here who may be familiar with Anthony Robbins and with the NLP network, you know, I mean, we got things, you know, uh, for the new behavior generator. We have creating anchors. We have uh, instantly learning how to get rid of uh, phobias and different things. Some very powerful techniques. So how is the techniques that's taught in NLP so, uh, that are so powerful superseded by uh, embraining? I think by just accepting these other two whole intelligences inside you enables you to reach in and get your own wisdom rather than being reliant on other people to do things for you. So um, if you think of the NLP communication model, and not everybody will be familiar with that, so I'll just kind of highlight the key bits, pretty much says that we take in information from our senses and that information in order to manage the sheer volume of it is processed and we were always taught it was processed at head level and it's either deleted or distorted or generalized and from that and filtered through our own filters of experience and culture and knowledge we create our own map of reality and everybody's map is slightly different that's a powerful model that helps to determine our behaviors and our results. If we now add into that, that there's a whole nother raft of information coming up in the body through the vagus nerve into the head, from the heart and from the gut, there's a whole nother set of information that needs to be added into that mix that NLP somewhere along the line overlooked. And so, if you take, for example, your sense of identity, which is actually held at gut level, that sense of identity, as you make meaning of it in the head, also is filtered, deleted, distorted, and generalized. So your created map of yourself and who you are and what you're capable of is just a map. It's not reality. And by recognizing that, you open up the opportunity to recreate that map into an even more effective, successful, compassionate you that you had built kind of boundaries around the extent of what you could achieve and now that opens up a whole new world of possibility. Ah, okay. Um, one of the things, uh, one of the things uh, for embraining, I mean, how is our heart and our guts also a brain? How do they think? Well, it's not Embraining International and Grant and Marvin that are calling it a brain. It's the science literature. Mm -hmm. And in order for it to be defined as a brain, there's several criteria that need to be met far above just being a number of neurons. Mm -hmm. So obviously there are lots of organs in the body where there's lots of neurons. You take your eye, for example, or your ear. They're not brains. So it also has to have a range of different types of neurons. There needs to be glial or support cells. It, the uh, adaptive network that is that brain needs to be able to self-regulate. And also it needs to be able to hold memory. So there's lots of different criteria before a set of neurons will be called a brain. Mm -hmm. and so the heart, well, if you take the heart, for example, we used to think it was a physical pump. Mm -hmm. We now know that it's far more complex than the physical pump. And although the heart has got the least number of neurons of the three brains that are currently recognized as brains, it's got somewhere between 30 and 120,000 neurons. Actually, it's an incredibly powerful part of the whole network. And we're kind of seeing that, particularly in leadership and in life effectiveness, being led from the heart and allowing the heart to do that role of leading has an enormous impact on how we do life. 
Ah, okay. Well, it's also a very interesting thing I found out about the heart. They say that the heart has the strongest magnetic field than any other organ within the body. Absolutely. It gives off more powerful electromagnetic radiation than the head brain. It means that, and where you might and your audience might relate to this is, I just wonder if they've ever been in a group of people where there was a particular energy or feeling in the group, either positive or negative. But let's take a, a neutral to positive. They're all having coffee in a workplace. Everything's kind of okay, no major. And then somebody comes into the room who's having a really bad day. And how quickly that person impacts through their heart radiation that they're giving off and the energy they're giving off that's negative, and they do what we call entrain the others into their energy. Mm -hmm. And so very quickly you can have a toxic infection, if you like, where everybody suddenly is being pulled into that negativity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So one of the things we teach people on embraining is how to interact with that state and how to interact with the energy, how to control the autonomic nervous system. Mm -hmm. And if we can ensure we're coming from a place of gratitude or compassion, which are two of the highest energy levels given off, we can ensure we're never entrained into someone else's negativity. What we will do is bring them into our positive state. Super. Now, we've got a lot of people out there who may be uh, actors, teachers, coaches, politicians. Which got, how would they use that heart energy in order to increase their uh, charisma within themselves and also a better connection with other people? For sure, the connection with people comes at heart level. If you connect with someone from head level, you're not really connecting with them. And so recognizing that self-awareness first, knowing exactly where you stand and who you, who you are, I think is the core. And then being able to connect at that heart level with somebody else totally changes the relationship. So I would think for educators, um, we pride ourselves on being student-centered, absolutely key. If you look at the shift of education away from didactic you know, preaching from the front, if you like, to a social constructionist view, you cannot do that if you're not connecting with your students at a true deep level where you want to know what's important to them and what's going on in their life as well. So that's kind of certainly one area I would say has a real impact. Um, in terms of um, the charisma side of it, mm -hmm. if you connect deeply with yourself and you know who you are, and you show as much compassion for yourself as you do for others, I think that charisma, which is your true authentic self, will shine out. I think you will allow people to see, that, see that real inner you that often we keep hidden away because we don't think it's quite acceptable enough or worthy enough. So it's about truly accepting and being compassionate about self as well so that we allow that to shine outwards to others. Yeah, that is absolutely that's you know that's absolutely positively correct. But like a, a lot of listeners out there who um, who uh, who uh, they're good singers, okay, or they're good poets, they're, they're good at whatever they do. But what makes that person go beyond just being good to being great is the ability to be able to connect with their audience. Does Embrain have exercises in order to uh, develop that particular intelligence? Absolutely. And the first thing, again, comes from them aligning themselves within. So you can technically be a very good singer, but you may not connect with your audience if you're not coming from that deep, highest sense of self that sits at the gut level. And from the gut level, you want to then bring in the heart as well as to what's important about you, what you really care about, your values, and then add to that your technical skills and that you know how to sing. And it's the alignment of all three of those that brings your performance to a whole new level. Okay. Now, once we get uh, alignment of all three of these, do our electromagnetic field actually begins to increase in order to connect with our audience and people even more strongly than before? The heart, um, certainly if you come from a highest expression of compassion and gratitude, then the amount of electromagnetic radiation from your heart will increase. Now, there is a limit to how far away from you that will be felt physically by another person. 
So if you're talking big audiences, it takes more than just that felt sense of the radiation to have an impact. And that's where I think your true authenticity would in itself shine out as well as the electric field that you're giving off. I think that's absolutely true. But which one of these, um, which one of our uh, brains is actually responsible for psychic phenomena? For psychic phenomenon? Yes, like uh, what? ESP, uh, telepathy, that type stuff. Well, at the moment, there's no conclusive evidence, empirical evidence, that they exist. So I wouldn't like to say conclusively where it links to our brains. Uh, okay, all right. So if we talk about resonance, basically I'm trying to figure out what's the difference between somebody who's average and they're trying their best to become number one and then somebody who's great and that they're able to connect with everyone and um, get their message through. Could you clarify that? How would you go doing that through Embrain? Yeah, I think that I would be um, coaching them within each of their own three brains initially, ensuring that each of the prime functions within those brains was working in a positive way. So if we take it, emotions, for example, at heart level, emotions can be sometimes destructive as well as positive so I would be working with each of the nine prime functions making sure they're all working in a positive direction then taking the person through a second round of embraining to go to highest expression so courage creativity and compassion mm -hmm. and once those three are all working to highest expression highest form of self what we find is a new form of wisdom emerges and they will know from inside what they need to shift to go from good to great. That sounds super. Also, uh, one of the things that uh, I learned in yoga and also from, uh, from photo reading with Paul Sheely um, is that uh, he made the statement that uh, information doesn't necessarily come from us, but it comes through us. Uh, do you have anything to say on that topic? Well, I have um, a fairly strong Christian faith background myself, and I've used this as my own part of my own spiritual journey as well. What I do is link with what I call the spiritual brain that is that connection for me, which is with God. It does, you know, I've got to respect people's models of their own Christian belief structures um, or non Christian belief structures, whatever their religious um, belief system is. But whatever that connection is to a higher form, a high, be it energy, universal, for me, God, I would bring that into my coaching so that I ensure that's part of the whole coaching package that I offer. Yeah. I mean, I have come from a strong Christian background as well, and there's a lot of times when you go through the Bible, you see that God, universe, spirit, or just from the Bible, it's because God, He gives people wisdom. And when He says He gives people wisdom, you say God, like is a uh, like fourth brain or the biggest brain or whatever. It's something that you don't intuit yourself. It's just something that's uh, that you anoint it with, uh, so to speak. I'm Absolutely. And with the um, bit of um, spiritual direction I've been doing with embraining, what people are describing is a connection through solar plexus, that it comes in somewhere between heart and gut. Mm -hmm. And it definitely comes in from outside and adds to what's already in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely see that. I definitely um, can see that. Uh, one thing that one thing that's um one thing that I see is that um talking about Amber uh, and a picture of what they call for the sh um, picture of what they call um uh, uh, chakras going on for the energy fields. I don't know. Do they have any scientific basis behind uh, what's going on with the chakras? Um, y have you ever heard of those before, Su Susan? Again, I don't know of any empirical evidence. It's something that we're often asked in embraining. How does it link with chakras and to some extent that you can see parallels mm -hmm. but it's again it's not a model that we integrate into embraining yeah I definitely I could definitely see that but it was one thing I found a lot of interesting that when they say that the uh, God or when the Holy Spirit came down upon Jesus it actually came down uh, on top of his head and uh, one thing that let me see if I can actually find a picture of that one of the pictures and again there's no uh, evidence like they said other than ancient wisdom like a lot of people um talk about let's see if I can find that picture but 
Let's see. And this is what happens when we're just having a conversation. Uh -huh. Chakras, cone. Certainly when I first coached ah, the first couple go. of people trying to um, introduce a spiritual brain into the mix, right. I, um, I pictured it above the head for exactly that reason, really. Mm-hmm. And, mm -hmm. and it did work. The coaching worked in that way. But the more I go on, the more people are describing it, as I say, as this connection through um, the solar plexus that is connecting deeply at heart and gut level, that combination of, um, of heart and gut. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, religion, too, can be very head based and we can get biblical knowledge. But unless we take it deep into ourselves at heart and gut, it's not really part of us. Right, right. So I quite like that connection to solar plexus because it really does go right into your center and you make a choice whether or not you integrate that into you. Yeah, I definitely I like that as well. Like on the gram, on the, uh, and this is whatever you go to, I see this thing. It's called your electrical field. That's what they call the aura. But then they got this hole at the top, which yeah. a lot of the times that when a person, um, uh, receives whatever spirit or whatever it comes from a top through this hole and goes through all of these energy centers so to speak so I always found that to be very um, interesting now in China I, a lot of people didn't believe in the you know what a meridian system is yeah okay a lot of people didn't believe in that but they use some type of the Chinese use some type of radionics or radi thing or put some type of uh, inserted uh, some serum or something in them, some radioactive serum, and they were able to chart that meridian system just from doing that. You ever heard about that? I've not heard of that research, but um, fairly familiar with the meridian system through acupuncture, particularly in um, you know reduction of pain in the healthcare system, which has some really phenomenal um, effects. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So again, I don't know if the empirical research behind it. Um, I would certainly be open to believing that there is a meridian system, but I don't understand how how we can kind of impact with that energy flow that arises from that. That's just not my field of expertise. Right. Um, one thing, you ever heard of Gary Craig with the emotional freedom technique? Uh, that's one of the things that he's been using is tapping on uh, certain uh, meridians throughout the body in order to dispel different phobias. Yeah. And again, I've um, I've got lots of my colleagues from NLP who have trained in that and speak very highly of it, but it's not one of the fields I'm trained in. Right. Now, let's get back on embraining. OK, uh, I want to know if you got everybody's going to be having these goals set up for 2015 coming up. Yeah. Uh, let's say that if you have one for weight loss, um, exactly. How would you use uh, this, um, the heart, the uh but your brain and your gut in order to use that in order to lose weight yep so um if i was taking someone through uh, through this before i even started the embraining process one of our key preparations is to settle the autonomic nervous system mm -hmm. if you have um any uh, extreme parasympathetic or sympathetic nervous system running you're not at your most effective at making decisions so the very easiest way to do that is through a simple breathing technique that we've taken from Steve Elliott's work. And we use the diaphragm as the bridge to the subconscious. And we teach people to breathe rhythmically, ideally six seconds in and six seconds out. And what that does is through the heart, it's the heart that controls the autonomic nervous system, we increase heart rate variability and that's our preparatory phase before we even begin to try to talk to the three brains. Mm -hmm. So if I was going to be talking with someone, I would be quietening them down in terms of getting them comfortable into a good posture so that they could breathe properly. And I'd then be talking them into a nice breathing rhythm of six seconds in and six seconds out for about three minutes, four minutes until I got the impression from watching them, you'll be aware of sensory acuity, that they were beginning to relax into, um, as I say, a coherent autonomic balance. Now, sometimes people can come, particularly for coaching, in a very stressed phase. Mm -hmm. And so what we're doing is bringing the sympathetic, that cortisol response down. And other people, if they've got into a very parasympathetic, depressed um, 
kind of withdrawn mode, what we're actually doing then is bringing them up and increasing their cortisol a little to get them back into balance. Once they're in balance, I would then always start at the, um, the normal coaching questions that we have, even from NLP, where are you currently at and where do you want to be? So unless people know where they want to go, you know, any road will take you there, as Alice in Wonderland says. Mm -hmm. But one of the big differences with embraining is once we know where they want to go, and we don't want too much detail about that because what we find is it's probably going to change as we coach them. Mm -hmm. The next question we asked is what stops you? And that can give us a really good indication as to which brain they're currently coming from and where any block might be. Mm Mm-hmm. So that's just the preparation. That's before we even start coaching them. Once we start coaching them, we're going to ask them at heart level, usually start at heart level, what do they really want? And just talk around that. This can be done beautifully conversationally as well as using a a kind of structure and structured tool, if you like. Really pushing for at that deep level, if they could only be successful, what would they really want as the outcome Mm -hmm. and that's directly as accessing the heart brain now we do have to usually educate people that the heart and gut don't talk in nice long fluid sentences like the head brain does Mm -hmm. and that's the importance again of quietening them initially so that they can really hear or see or feel those prompts from the inside which they're not going to do if they're in a stress response So depending what comes up there, we might take that up to head brain next and ask what the head brain thinks of that. The head does logic beautifully, rationality, it makes up stories. What are the stories it's run from the past? Why hasn't weight loss techniques worked in the past? And we would be looking for what are the plans your head would be thinking of now? We're not going to worry too much about that at the moment. Again, this is going to evolve as you push through the conversation. And then at gut level, you're going to be asking about motivation. You're going to be asking about identity. And it's very difficult to give a generic answer because it so depends what comes up by the individual you're talking to. But you may have someone who is holding being fat at identity level. I've always been fat. I never remember, you know, even as a kid, I don't remember never being um, not fat, if you like. So we're looking for where the key um, kind of where's that place we can get real movement all like like systems analysis really what's the pivot point that we can get into and really make a difference and we're going to just talk at that stage around all three brains and then depending what comes up we're going to go through a second run then working with these prime functions of each brain and making sure that in relation to this issue of um, weight loss or the inability to lose weight in the past, we're going to go back around those three brains again, looking at the prime functions for each of them. So again, assessing values, again, assessing how that might affect connectivity with others, for example. Um, If someone's in a family where there's unhealthy eating habits, there's a big problem for them having to go and do something completely different from everyone else in the family. So there may be a restriction there to be able to, um, you know, to stop them going forward. Mm -hmm. At head level, we're then going to go again into all the options and possibilities they can think of, let them go wild creatively and get them curious about how they might solve it. And at gut level again, what would they need to do And what would they need to be able to do to make those steps happen? Mm -hmm. And then you're beginning to move towards these highest expressions, which is where the real aha moments and changes happen. So up until now, you're getting them aware of the strategies that they're currently running. Mm -hmm. And now you're really offering them, how would you do it differently? So at heart level, what would be the most compassionate thing you could do for yourself and for your family in relation to this issue? Mm -hmm. at head level what would be the most creative way of tackling this effectively and at gut level what's the most courageous thing you could do who would you be if you started being a slim fit healthy person what would that look like what would you be doing differently 
So we build up through what we call the foundational sequence, a whole raft of conversation, which is iterative in as much as the routine would change depending what the person brought up. At any point, they might block at one brain. So they may have, the whole problem might be that they're not using one brain at all. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking of, let's take someone who has got an identity, they've always been fat. They may have that they're not worthy to be anything other than fat. They're not special enough. They're not good enough. Well, Hold on, we just went off. Lost connection there. Oh, it's okay. Just go ahead and call her back. Um, yeah. So we got a. We got, there she is. Uh, okay, you're back again. Could you repeat that again? That sounded like it was very important. Uh, so I'm not quite sure where I lost you exactly, but I was talking about um people who, for whatever reason, may not be using one of their brains. Mm -hmm. And if you've got a lot of negative identity issues going on, and there's been a lot of hurt in the past, it might be um, teasing at school, it might be not mm -hmm. being able to be in the sports team. Mm -hmm. At heart level, what they might have done is actually cut the heart brain out of the equation. Mm -hmm. And so at gut level, they'll be saying, I'm fat, I'm useless. And at head level, they'll be justifying that story and making up uh, the meaning around that to justify that stance. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So one of the most important things we can do for someone like that is to get the heart brain open again to allow it to be part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. And that has to be done gently and respectfully. It may not happen quickly, although sometimes it does. And we would be in any way possible talking through the heart brain what does the heart brain need to hear or know in order that it will begin to communicate again and we'll go back around the three brains and they'll be talking to each other internally so it might say it needs to hear something from the head or it needs to hear something from the gut mm -hmm. and we'll go back to those and we'll say are they willing to say it and we'll facilitate that conversation internally between the brains and gradually you get to the point where all three brains are happy to say whatever they think is important, what's happening for them, and then we'll start to talk through the alignment phase where we're going, so if this is what we want, are all three brains in a line with that? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. For me, I think this is one of the, the differences, the key differences with coaching to multiple brains is we're absolutely ensuring that whatever the solution they come up with, one, it's their own solution, so they own it, they're committed to it, but two, that you've absolutely checked that it's in line with exactly who they are and what they want. So they're far more likely then to follow it through and make it a reality. Okay, that, that sounds, that sounds, us. Uh, uh, Definitely, that's a lot to take in. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right, Susan. Um, are any NLP te techniques actually used um, in inbraining? We don't require people to be NLP trained to train them as a coach. However, it is really useful. And some of those um, techniques or skills, if you like, are things like sensory acuity. So being able to pick on, on subtle shifts and probe in different areas because of those subtle shifts. We use things like submodalities. Mm -hmm. So as we're, um, when we come up with, if you like, this aligned goal and this uh, new emerged wisdom, we will then go back through and kind of um, install a really positive form of that through using submodalities. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of NLP in there woven within the techniques and anyone who's NLB trained will pick up the whole process much, much quicker. But you don't have to be NLP trained to train as an MBIT coach. Okay, so uh, one of the questions that someone asked me was, do, uh, do, does the heart and gut drain like our brain does? They absolutely do. And what we now know is that the gut has a 90 minute dream cycle just like the head does. Um, now, we've always kind of known that there's some processing that goes on overnight and that dreams are part of that processing and making sense of what's gone on during a busy day. But now we know that the gut also dreams and has that 90 minute cycle. So you may well get um, gut movements at night that you hadn't really thought 
um, you know about what was going on and and now you can be more aware if you if you do wake up and there's a gut feel going on then it could well be that it's it, mid dream that it's you've woken up okay so what does the, what does the heart and gut dream about <laughs> uh, well I would imagine that links back to prime function so the heart based prime functions are um, emotions values and connecting with people and the gut is about identity motivation and at the highest expression courage so I think for me and I have no empirical evidence to support this but I would imagine that the gut is going to be um, integrating in and updating if you like that identity with what's gone on in the day so that your sense of who you are is reprocessed if you like every night mm -hmm, mm -hmm. okay interesting so uh, the thing like we're going up and we're flying in the sky and all that other type stuff when we're getting up and we're flying uh is that more is that does that have anything to do with our multiple brains um i don't know i haven't seen any work on dreams and um dream analysis yet linked to gut brain dreaming so i honestly don't know the answer to that okay all right i know it's because a lot of times a lot of times uh we're nothing more than uh uh what uh, an archetype or in our dreams were us but then we still have uh i think we have a dream heart a dream brain and a dream gut you know where we're dreaming um while we're dreaming as well so i wonder if we kind of make those same decisions and stuff uh while we're sleeping in the same way as we would if we're actually awake i mean possibly and the and the use of symbolism and metaphor i'm sure is a large part of that because as i said before the gut doesn't talk in nice fluid sentences in the way that the head brain does so part of our skill set i guess and our own growth is learning to listen to our inner voices that are very quiet and very subtle and only really by being quiet can we begin to do that and then beginning to recognize what those symbols mean to us which will be very unique and individualized one of the things that embraining has done for me in my coaching is absolutely um gone in with a blank page if you like when i coach people mm -hmm. because what they come up with the symbols the metaphors they arise with I would never have dreamt of in a million years and so it really does make you sit back and respect the client and their map of the world and what they bring to you in a in a much more heightened way mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's definitely um, yeah I could definitely uh, see that uh, one and also another question that came up is just like we got food that feeds the brain uh, feeds our brain between our ears uh, you know, ginkgo boil fish and different stuff like that. Do we have, is, are there foods that actually um, feed your heart and your gut as well? Certainly gut. We're learning an awful lot about the gut in the last, um, you know, recent history that we didn't realize. So, for example, serotonin, I'm sure you would have heard of serotonin and many of your audience would have done, is 85% of serotonin is produced in the gut. Mm -hmm. So gut health is highly, highly related to mental health. Mm -hmm. um, the whole kind of sphere of uh, microbiome in the gut and probiotics is hugely important and only now are we really beginning to get the full knowledge behind that of how important it is okay so um, you know coming from a personal training perspective so by increasing what type of diet would we need in order to increase our guts intelligence because they also said our gut brain is like the size of a cat or something uh, in terms of the number of neurons it's um it's a not analogous to the size of a cat's brain yeah for sure um physically it's quite large because it goes right from mouth to anus um so it's quite widespread but the number of neurons is similar to a cat's brain yeah so in terms of the diet, you're going to want to make sure that you've got good probiotic cover, that you've got, a, you know, a healthy diet, range of all the nutrition going in and also good fiber, all of that gut health that we've known. But maybe what we haven't known in the past is that that's far more important than just for digestion. It's also hugely important to mental health. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But it's also I've heard I've um, looked on the internet. They said uh, that there's a link between parasites, which is in the guts, and mental depression and suicide. 
Yeah, um, there's a lot of research studies being done at the moment around um, even, sounds a little bit gross and apologies to your audience, but even taking fecal matter from one person and put it in another and seeing whether the change of that microbiotic kind of makeup changes people and it definitely does. So wow. as I say, we're really just touching the surface of that at the moment and um, I think we've still got a lot to learn about how as an individual then we can change our kind of whole probiotic makeup in order to increase our health, our fitness and our mental well-being. What is a probiotic? The probiotics are the um, the bacteria that you deliberately take in which is your good bacteria in the bowel so you can take it for example in live yogurts but you can also get good probiotic tablets okay so we can get um there's those uh, bacteria or whatever does it if, if we're constipated and we're not having regular bowel movements that affect our behavior and and that stuff it will certainly affect your behavior because it will affect the whole of the gut health which is then going to affect the serotonin release so it's only in a really good functioning, healthy bowel that you've got your serotonin being produced at the amounts it should be produced at. As soon as your serotonin levels drop, it is going to affect your your mental wellness. Okay. I have a friend of mine who's a, a shaman um, from years back, and he was telling me about uh, how when they go on vision questing that they take the time out to cleanse out their colon and um, you know get everything clean out for fasting and stuff. And that was the way that they unified their spirit, mind, and body for uh, certain things on that. So, uh, is cleansing out your colon or in fasting, does that have a tendency to increase uh, one's brain, uh, gut brain intelligence? Yeah, if your gut brain is not having to concentrate on digesting food, it allows the space and the quiet for you then to look at the other side of the function. So, yeah, again, if you look in the Bible, you know, fasting is um, it's well represented in the Bible, but it's only now we're beginning to get the scientific background, if you like, as to why that worked. Now, obviously, you've got to be careful about how you fast you've got to make sure you keep drinking fluid you've got to be not fasting for too long periods of time but there's some good evidence coming out that you know um careful fasting can be very good for that inner insight and as soon as you go to the inner insight if you add in a spiritual component to that mm. then you're going to get good connection with that spiritual connection yeah, that's one of the things I study and also is that after about three days, the stomach stops digesting stuff and the energy that was utilized for, for uh, digestion then goes about to healing the body, increase intelligence, etc. Yeah, um, so again, you've got to be careful with keeping hydrated, but yeah, absolutely, you're right. There's a lot of literature coming out to support that. Um, one of the interesting things for me is that um, they're proposing that the appendix is like a storage of your gut bacteria so that even when you have like really um, a lot of diarrhea and so you're clearing out the bowel mm -hmm. there is a store of your bacteria there that can repopulate the bowel once the diarrhea is stopped so I guess the challenge is how do you if you've got a um, set of probiotics that are not the best fit for you how do you do a change and it does take a sustained um, deliberate um, diet and probiotic regime to change your whole system over. Okay, so by and to, by having a diet that works with prop, uh, works with that bacteria, the probiotics and everything, yep. it increases our level, uh, our expression of uh, self identity, uh, self protection, and also courage. Yep, and motivation. So motivation and movement is your other core prime function at, at gut level. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess what I've been alluding to here is that mental health link through the serotonin and dopamine cycle. So, you know, obviously we'd all want to be happy, healthy, mm -hmm. positively minded. Mm -hmm. um, th this is a huge way of making steps towards that. Mm -hmm. Mm, that's definitely, you know, uh, keeping the body eating healthy and stuff is definitely is good for optimizing our spirit, soul, and um, body. Um, one of the things, uh, so when Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, uh, how would M-Brain re relate to that, if any? 
<laughs> so embraining is not a Christian tool. I happen to have a Christian um, faith myself, and so I've done kind of some of the personal reflections on how that links to my Christianity and my spiritual journey. Mm -hmm. I think 40 days fasting is, it's a lot, and it was a real... Um, it was a trial for Jesus to fast for 40 days. Mm -hmm. And I do wonder, you know, we're not told whether he had anything at all in that time or whether there was just a hugely reduced diet. Did he have good water supply? We, you know, the Bible doesn't give us all the facts that scientifically we'd like to have. We know that the body can go without food for extended periods of time. We know that um, prisoners have fasted and lasted a long time on, you know, on fasting. I think f for me, um, 40 days for Jesus, that was a core part of his ministry in terms of finding out what, what he was about and what his mission on earth was to do. I've never fasted for 40 days, so I can't comment in terms of the impact it would have, but I would imagine that would take you right back to your core right back to his connection with God um, and really when he came out of there he, he kind of knew exactly who he was and what he was about. Yeah, um, it's also been a thing for uh, Jesus was the only one that fasted like 40 days. We got Socrates, Aristotle, Pythagoras, a lot of them also went on 40 day water fast in order for uh, purification so we found out it's just not a Christian thing but it yep. was just an overall uh, it was overall intelligence or the, the upper class or the spiritual things back during that time. That's one of the things that they actually went through. And uh, one of the things that Pythagoras actually uh, talked about was that by going, by fasting, it actually opened up different levels of dimensions um, in the mind for, um, for, uh, th for being able to think on higher levels. So that's, yep. yeah, so, you know, because that's why when I went, Jesus fasted 40 days. Well, he was Jesus. Of course he can fast for 40 days, okay? <laughs> but then I'm looking at, well, why did Pythagoras, Socrates, and um, Aristotle, and all these other people, they adopted 40-day um, fast as well. And I'm like, it must be something to that uh, as far as, because they, all of these were great people. And from r the reading that I've done on the Internet and talking to people who fast, They've all talked about enhanced physical performance, enhanced physical prowess, a high level of mental clarity, and a profound sense of mental, uh, a profound sense of inner peace. Again, that profound sense of inner peace related to spirit, the high level of um, functioning, you know, between your brain, and increased physical prowess going over to your gut and body. So that's why I was looking at the connection between embraining and uh these people who's doing these on uh, doing this fasting yep and one of the things embraining has has done is begun to link that modern neuroscience with ancient wisdom mm -hmm. and we're finding now that a lot of what they used to do through the ancient spiritual traditions we're now having the scientific evidence as to why it worked so we've taken it on faith in the past and now we're showing why it works in practice. And I think this is just one of those areas. And there's going to be lots of others. The whole realm of meditation or prayer and what that achieves as well by quietening those, that kind of inner, inner self and particularly the ego and finding space to get around the ego so that we can reconnect with source. So, mm -hmm, yeah, embraining, mm -hmm. as I say, for me has also been a very spiritual journey, even though it's not written as a Christian set of tools. I think what's amazing is that anyone can apply their own spiritual tradition to it and it transfers across all of them. Yeah, and one of the amazing things that I found was studying with Pythagoras and um, uh, one of the things that he said that he did was he breathed a certain, in order to transform himself during a 40 day fast, that he breathed a certain way and he thought a certain way and at the end of the 40 days, he says, well, I'm not the man that I used to be. I'm a totally transformed person. And I'm looking at the embraining thing. And the very first thing that they talked about was breathing. Yeah. The breathing is um, incredibly simple, but incredibly powerful. And it really does allow you to connect in with the unconscious mind. So I use um, the breathing in particular in workshops for stress reduction, 
for burnout in healthcare and carers, and it's having amazing impact. So even without all the embraining coaching, just that preparation phase mm -hmm. of teaching people to manage their autonomic nervous system is hugely, hugely helpful. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's get down to the good stuff. Tell us about your testimonials, about uh, the people that you've actually worked with and got results. Can you give us some, some case examples? Yeah, um, so I've worked with uh, people from a variety of different contexts. I suppose stress is one of the major ones. I've had people say to me that it's been life-saving for them in terms of teaching them the breathing um, patterns in relation to their stress that is work-related. Mm -hmm. We seem to be in a time where stress is just becoming all-encompassing, really, and we're almost accepting it as part of normal so when you can teach people to manage that and get back to a settled, grounded core, it's life transformational for them. So that's been one major area that I've had lots of people have success in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I've coached CEOs in terms of where company, um, the company's going in terms of direction and reconnecting with staff to take them on that journey that has changed whole companies. Mm -hmm. um, I've worked with teams where they begin to respect each other in a different way by all of them doing this process together so that they really do begin to grow together and not leave anybody behind. Mm. Uh, do you have any special stories about any individuals who um, like they maybe had some type of disease or something and then um, they went through some type of remission or you know they would have a lot of heartache and by going through the process they found a, a, a serene peace within themselves? Yeah, I've certainly, I mean, going back to the stress, I've certainly worked with one individual who was really at the end of their tether. Um, they had gone so far as to write a suicide note. Mm. Um, they really didn't know how to carry on. They had, their, you know, they were intelligent, they were strong, they were well-skilled, but kind of the environment had taken over and they just felt that they had no way of influencing Mm -hmm. And working with them both to manage the stress, but also to get them to reconnect with who they were, what they were on the earth to do, and putting the work environment into a context where it was only a work environment and they could choose to walk away. Um, as I say, they actually said it was life-saving for them. Mm. That's probably my most, um, you know, most transformational change in, in a person okay so a person when they be going through the uh we got mbit uh, multiple brain um integration and then we got uh embraining because you call it uh multiple braining because we we, ha we may have more than just three brains correct yeah so embraining is the process of using the brains and mbit is the set of tools that tells you how to do it so the two are complementary to each other but yeah you're right we're expecting within the next kind of five or ten years that there may be a, at least another two brains being called brains that we get the imaging and the technology to prove that they've got all those criteria and that would be the reproductive brain and the vagus nerve in its own right but they're not yet brains but it was why Grant and Marvin called it embraining, not three braining, because mm -hmm. we are expecting that number to increase as our technology and our ability to image the body increases. Okay, so the very first thing that a person um, have when they're embraining is the, that six, sec six second diaphragmic breathing, which helps the person to get into uh, an alternate state of consciousness, to be completely relaxed, and then to be able to access the inner wisdom within ourselves with both the heart. Um, what's between our ears, our brain, our mind, and then also with the um, also with our guts, and then from our heart we be going for a, a sense of compassion, a sense of value. What's actually driving me to uh, driving me or leading me uh, towards achieving that goal? And then from our brain, between our ears, we got that sense of creativity. Uh, what are the many ways in order for to achieve this goal? And then from my guts, which you'll say it again, is the highest expression, which is courage, which is also self-protection. And, um, you know, give us some motivation to go forward um, is and also identity is, uh, you know, is give us the ability to be able to follow through uh, whatever plan and whatever value um, that's going through with us. So if a person was wanting to uh, lose weight, they'd have to find a positive aspect towards, find, they have to find a positive aspect 
towards uh what drives me what pulls me in order to i said i need to lose weight because my daughter wants me to live a long time and then what's the best part and then that's from the heart i mean that's one's compassion and then from the brain it would be like all right what's the best technique or whatever for me to get that to put a smile on my face and then the hardest part though which is the bot which is the guts the guts of the thing is uh you know finding the courage in order to in in order to actually follow through on um what your compassion with your heart and um what's between your um ears your brains i'm um, telling you to do now from anthony robbins it says uh for the very first thing you do once you make a decision is actually to find uh take immediate action on that in order to give you the momentum that you need to go in order to go in that um direction um did I do okay with that? It's absolutely spot on. The only thing I would slightly just, um, uh, I guess, um, just kind of clarify is that the breathing is not for relaxation. Mm -hmm. The breathing actually gets you to calm alertness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you can, once you know how to change the autonomic system, you can use a breathing technique to go into relaxation. And a lot of yoga or meditation do that by extending the out breath. Mm -hmm. But we don't actually want people relaxed. We want them to be calm, alert, so that they can fully access their inner wisdom, their inner intelligence, and make some really wise decisions. Okay. All right. So, uh, unification of the spirit, the mind, and the body. Well, we say that the, when I say unification of the spirit, mind, and body, would I be correct or incorrect as to say the spirit is representation of the heart, the mind is like the representation of your brain, what's between your ears, and your body is being your heart or your gut? Yeah, I think that's where we come back to this. Where does that spiritual connection come? And some people do link it to heart. Um, I think for me that spiritual connection is a combination of heart and gut. It's somewhere between the two and like a combination of both. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's, not, it's not a phrase that, that I necessarily use in Embraining. I talk head, heart and gut. I don't talk um, spirit and soul. Mm -hmm. But, mm -hmm. you know, each person will make this work for them in the map of their reality. And really the... The key thing is about listening internally, trusting that inner intelligence, quietening down the head so that it doesn't dominate in a negative way, and just being pleasantly surprised at the new wisdom that emerges that allows you to go to all sorts of places that you didn't think you could go before. Yeah, that's definitely on point on that. And one of the things that they talk, as a, a friend of mine, what it says, I read on it, and he's a wise man. He talks about, he says that all paths, at least to death, therefore choose to path with heart. And I was kind of scratching my head like that. I was kind of scratching my head on that because it just makes sense. You know, but a lot of us here in the Western world, we're so uh, doggedly trying to make that money. So doggedly trying to get physical things when all along it's the experiences or what really makes you happy and finding out who are, who are you and stuff yes yeah. yeah we need a new form of wisdom on the planet we need a form of wisdom that is compassionate and courageous that is connecting with all people so that it's not a small percentage of people have everything uh, I was at San Diego just last week at the ILA Global Conference on Leadership and Otto Sharma was one of our keynote speakers. Mm -hmm. And what he said concurred so much with what Grant is saying. And if I can just share with you Grant's kind of vision for embraining. Mm -hmm. Now that we know that the brain is plastic, we know that you can change neural connections. We know that you can create new neural pathways. If we could change the physical structure of every brain on the planet to be more compassionate so that we meant, made wiser decisions that had everybody's best at heart, then that's the sort of world we want to live in. Wow, that is absolutely beautiful. You know, I think that is too. All right, Suzanne. Um, uh, how, do you have anything else that you would like to add concerning embraining about your uh about your company and how you can be contacted and things 
yeah i mean i'd like if and i'm sure there'll be questions following this feel free to get in touch with me through my website embrainingforsuccess.com also have a look at grant's core site embraining.com there's a wealth of free resources on there interviews with key leaders in the field um the breathing technique there's a tape on there that you can listen to to help you with your breathing all I would say to you is give it a go. Go and find out about it. Go and find out where your local trainers are because this stuff is the most gentle and the most transformational change work I've ever come across. Yeah, and I'm definitely agreeing with that, especially especially learning how to think with my how to think with my heart. And the way that we think of our heart is with compassion. Absolutely. And the way we think. But compassion for self and others. So it's not a soft, weak compassion. Mm -hmm. It's a strong, grounded compassion, uh, compassion that makes positive change in the world. It's got that outward world community focus. And that's why I think it links so beautifully with the spiritual traditions. It does. In that it's for positive good of everybody. Yeah, and that's what it says uh, when, when they talk about love the Lord that God with all their heart, all their mind, all their strength. And the next one is love thy neighbor as thou love thyself. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. And that's going on with that compassion thing because we got to learn how to take care of ourselves. Because if we don't learn how to take care of ourselves, then how are you going to learn how to take care of other people? Yeah. You know? Absolutely so, right. Yeah. So, you know, but, but we don't, so we're not trying to hoard everything we hear. To help other people, you know, by staying healthy and you know learning what we got, we're here to share whatever we got in order to make everyone in the planet a better place to live. Yep. Mm. And with the number of people on the planet going up, you know, we're not going to be able to carry on the way we've been going for very much longer. Yeah, very much. The planet's going to make sure of that. <laughs> 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 okay, everyone. Um, be sure to go over to. Um, Let's see, bring in Braining for Success. Again, that's in Braining uh, for Success with Miss Suzanne um, Henwood. And she's a PhD and she's also a very excellent trainer. You hear today um, general topic of how to unify your spirit, your mind, and your body. Or like I like to say now, is your, is your heart, uh, what's between your ears and your gut. In order to help you to achieve the goals that you have. So when you're making these New Year's resolutions. The very first thing I want you to do. To help you to push you to forward. Whatever goal what it means. Ask yourself what's the compassion on it. You know that's going to push you. What, uh, what's, how am I going to make the better world a better place. By doing what I'm doing. What's the best and fun way in order to make this happen. And what immediate steps and everything that I need to do in order to make that happen or oh, and you know, that's at the same time that's uh ecological with myself okay for the self-protection and everything because sometimes you can sting yourself and um it may not be healthy for you to do that uh, what you think about that suzanne yep absolutely if everyone just asks themselves in the morning what's the most courageous compassionate creative way i could be on the planet today we would start to make a difference one person at a time okay and what's the most courageous what's the most creative what is the most compassionate thing that i could do today to help everyone yep including yourself to help everyone including myself how can we make this world a better place is that right yep all right, and definitely I'm going to start using that as my mantra from now on. <laughs> Fantastic. All right, everyone, this is Health Awareness Talk. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you indeed for having me. Lovely to have met you. It's also lovely to have meeting you as well. This is uh, Malik L. Train with Health Awareness Talk through www.surbroadcast.com. Everyone, have a blessed day or night wherever you're at. Thank you.